Welcome back. In this video, we will be looking at uh, again uh, at a very very low level, we will be looking at deep RNNs as well as bidirectional RNNs. Deep RNNs are particularly important in language, especially Google Translate for example uses deep RNNs at a certain level. So, let me write that down. So, the Google Translate that you will see if you go to translate.google.com, we know because Google has published a paper that it uses at some level it uses deep RNNs. Now, what are deep RNNs? Let us look at just one of these. Okay. If I look at one of these within the RNN, it is just an ANN. Okay. As we saw with normal RNNs, in a normal RNN all you had was one input layer, one hidden layer and one output layer. In a deep RNN all you do is that one single layer of the RNN actually becomes a deep neural network. That is the only difference between a deep RNN and a normal RNN. Okay. So, now each of these could by themselves be LSTMs etcetera. So, we are not going to discuss that, but let us assume that each of these are actually deep networks. Now, all that happens here is there is a connection between each layer okay, or each time sequence. Remember, in this direction we have time and in this direction we have layers. Okay. So, the number of layers decide how deep it is, okay. though sometimes you know by abuse of notation even I have said this is depth. Okay, this is this direction is not really depth, depth actually is along the layers. Okay. So, this is either time or sequence etcetera. Okay. So, now what is it? You can think of this as if it is a single deep neural network unrolled. Okay. That is all, it is unrolled and it is the same structure repeated again and again and again and of course, the weights are also always the same. Okay. Now, what is the big deal about deep RNNs? Obviously, they let you uh, deal with more complex structure. Now, if I look at some arbitrary unit, let us say this unit. So, let us say this represents level 1, this represents level 2 and this represents level 3. This of course, is y hat okay. and of course, this is time unit 1, time unit 2, time unit 3, time unit 4. Okay. So, if I look at some element, let me say this element. Okay. So, let us draw that element now. this is the one I am looking at right now. Okay. So, this is h, this hidden unit, this is time sequence, let us denote time sequence as t and by superscript let us give the le level, this is 2 or in general this is going to be l. Okay. So, in this specific case this element would be h 3 Now, what comes in is the previous one. Now, as you can see time decreases here. So, this is h t minus 1 at the same level and what comes in from below is instead of x which is what used to happen in a normal single hidden layer RNN. In this case in a deep RNN what is below is actually h itself t minus 1 oh sorry t. L minus 1. Okay. So, when this is the case, we need to write the general expression. Remember, our general expression would be h t L, nothing much changes tan h of w times h t minus 1 L plus u times h t l minus 1. Okay. Now, there is one small catch of course, with each level. Okay, so, this one will have w 1 u 1, this one will have w 2 u 2, this one will have w 3 u 3. That is the difference here. So, in this case we would say that you have w l u l. So, instead of one single w and u which is what we used 
for an RNN um, or a normal RNN, you will have multiple Ws and multiple Us. That is the only difference between a deep RNN and a usual RNN. Now, the other thing you can see is, of course, when you do back propagation through time or any back propagation, it can get fairly complex because the gradient pathways are multiple. To go from here to here, you could go this way, you could go this way, you have all sorts of ways. This is basically what TensorFlow and things like that actually make a little bit easy. They will draw a graph of what the dependencies are of each thing on everything else and they will automatically calculate the gradient for you. So, deep RNNs are extremely useful as I said in the beginning, especially in language tasks. But above and beyond what we have already discussed, there is uh, other than computational complexity, there is no real notional complexity above and beyond what we have other than multiple Ws and multiple Us. The second thing that we look at is something called bidirectional RNNs. Sometimes you might even find the term by LSTM, which simply is a bidirectional RNN using LSTMs rather than the usual RNN. These might be deep or not deep, it really does not matter. Now, what are these for? These are for tasks that actually are sequential, but the sequence can go both backward and forward. That is, not only does the future depend on the past, so to speak, but the past also depends on the future. Now, what would be an example of that? Let me give you a very, very simple example, though you can think of several things even in engineering problems. I will come back to that. So, suppose I write something of this sort okay? and you have a optical character recognition tool, uh, which basically means you, this is handwritten and just like we saw with MNIST, you want to recognize a handwritten digit. Similarly, you want to recognize what is this word. Okay? Now, suppose the way usually RNNs will do it is this will be input 1, this image will be input 2, this image will be input 3 and this image will be input 4. Now, suppose I go only in one direction. Okay. It will read S, it will read O and it will not know whether this letter is T or whether it is F. Okay. So, the probability of this will actually not be known okay. because you are only seeing that particular letter and the past letters. Now, however, as a human being, if you see and identify this letter as T very clearly, you can actually go back and correct yourself. Okay. In fact, if uh, I am not sure Microsoft editor, uh, equation editor uses that, but you can actually see it if there is now an option uh, in Microsoft equation editor called ink, where you can write things by hand, it will actually go back and correct what it said before. So, if I actually read both backward and forward, okay, this is usually how we read even with our eyes. We sort of guess what the middle letters are based on what happens at the end. In such cases, you will need a bidirectional reading. Okay. That is, you will go this way, read it, you will go that way, read it and sort of the joining of these two is what tells you what each letter is. It is not only what happened uh, in one sequence direction or the other sequence direction. Okay. So, you can in fact see this even in the sensor problem that I told you about. Suppose you want to guess whether a person is sitting or not and you are at right at the beginning of a signal. If you go back and look at that video, you will see signals like this. But if I am right at the beginning of the signal, how do I figure out what it is a part of? At the beginning, you actually have to guess by what happens in the future to see what the meaning of the first term is. So, this is also an example, even though we did not really use by LSTMs there, but typically this is a good use case there too. Okay. Now, how do we actually do bi bidirectional LSTM? It is a small tweak over the usual RNN. So, let us look at a figure. So, I am going to reduce our boxes to circles here. Once again, let us say this is x1, this is h1 and this is y1 hat. So, usually we would go in the forward direction. and you would usually write something like h t vector is let us say tan h of w h t minus 1 vector plus u x t vector. So, this is what we usually do. 
and plus of course one b vector also to add bias sometimes i forget writing the bias down okay now what we do when we are doing bidirectional lstms or rnns is add an additional vector remember x1 x2 x3 are fixed these are simply our inputs if you look at the soft word this would be s this is o this is f and let's say if you have x4 that would be t but i have a choice on what i can do for the hidden unit okay so not only do i add a forward vector i add a reverse vector also and i will say ht in the reverse we'll draw the opposite vector is tan h now h2 will not depend on h1 but it will actually depend on h3 the h2 reverse vector okay so this i will say is w we'll call this w forward call this w reverse even though these are not vectors you can add additional weights h t plus 1 vector plus u remains you add another correction factor here plus b inverse vector okay so now you have added three new parameters this is just like what we did with lstms this is forward parameters even though these are not vectors i have called them forward just for you to see it you have inverse parameters okay now what about y if i look at yt now yt will take an input not only from here but also from here so y usually used to be simply some nonlinearity of v times ht now we are going to make it some v forward times ht plus v reverse times ht reverse plus of course actually i don't need to put inverse or forward let's simply say c so now you see here you have the bias unit you have these two vectors you have these two okay one other bias so this is six parameters and nine parameters totally okay so nine so both in reading documents figuring out speech okay sometimes you can figure out what i am saying after i say a few words okay so even translation actually requires a bidirectional task okay you cannot translate a full sentence until you know the full sense of the sentence so you want to go back as well as you want to go forward as well as you want to go back so in such cases bidirectional rnns are useful again over and beyond what we have said most of the other things are simply unrolling the graph and doing back prop okay otherwise there is no other difference from what we have done so far so in this video we looked at both deep rnns as well as bidirectional rnns these are just small tweaks depending on particular which use uh, you want to put it to uh, this depends on you um, these both are alternate sort of architectures for rnns thank you